it is ready. Okay, great. All right, so yeah, so we're, we're trying to set up this Bernoulli problem. We found the, the n was one-third, so u is equal to y to the two-thirds. Now, we know what the new transform equation would become. Did we all find that in the next Okay, Luis, why don't you go, go ahead and tell me what you think we've got. Uh, the u prime. U prime. Plus um, 1 minus n. Uh-huh. Q of x, u. Equal to 1 minus n, uh, u of x. That's it. Okay, this is the new equation. This, this one, you really do need to know. Put it under your pillow every night for the next four nights. <laughs> By osmosis, get it to sink in there for you. You're going to want to have that one. Okay? So, uh, so let's put in all the stuff we, we know now. So we have u prime, 1 minus n. So important to get this right because this is going to affect the, the integration and everything that's going to come later. So 1 minus n is actually equal to what? It's two-thirds, right? It's two-thirds. So plus two-thirds times p of x. Now, p of x includes the minus sign. So the p of x here is the, from the original problem, negative three over two x. And that's times u equals, and then we have two-thirds of q of x, which is, so what is q of x? 6x squared ln x. Very good. It's basically everything over here except for the y power part. Okay. So we just add that. Let's just simplify this real quick. So we have u prime, ah, 2 thirds and 3 halves cancels out. It just becomes minus 1 over x times u equals, and here I have 12 over 3, which is 4x squared ln of x. So far so good? Okay, great. So now um, we have a new differential equation, and what kind of equation do we have? It's linear now, right? The Bernoulli equations always become linear. Exactly. So we have a linear equation, so what am I going to need to do next for a linear problem? Right, I have to find my integrating factor. So let's do that right here. The formula is e to the integral of p of x dx. So very important, guys, the p of x here is the new p of x that is in the problem we're now solving. It's not the original p of x. So got to keep these things straight. So it's just going to be e to the integral of negative 1 over x dx, right? to the integral of negative 1 over x dx. Okay, and what is that going to give me? Right, negative ln of x, right? And we don't need a plus c on this, okay? Um, by the way, I can just assume that x is greater than 0 because the original problem wouldn't even make sense if x is negative because you can't take the ln of a negative number. So I'm just going to avoid putting any absolute value bars on anything. Okay, uh, and what does this simplify to? Right. Remember the minus coefficient actually becomes an exponent, so it's x to the minus 1, or if we prefer, we can write it as 1 over x. Great. Okay, so we have that, and now remember what happens with the linear equation. The integrating factor times the unknown function form a product rule, so the derivative of that product is equal to and now we basically have to multiply the right-hand side of the equation by the integrating factor. So 4x squared ln x, I have to divide that by x. So that will give me what? 4x ln x, right? Okay. 4x ln x. Um, all right, here's another. This integral, okay, here's the problem, guys. This integral... <laughs> I don't have a table of integrals with me. This table of integrals doesn't have that particular integral in it, and I did add it to the integral table that you guys have that I will be passing out on the exam. So it, it comes from there. Uh, oh, I know what I can do to get the answer. I have my solution. No, you use integration by parts for that. But um, this one would be in your table, so you don't have to worry about it. Let me just tell you what you're going to get. Um, okay, so 
basically you have to integrate both sides. So 1 over x times u. Turns out you get 2x squared ln of x minus x squared. And this time you do have to put a plus c. Okay. Again, don't sweat that stuff. That's the stuff when you had your table with you, you would have that in there. <clears throat> okay. So now I can solve for u. So u is x times that whole thing. Am I allowed to take this plus c and just put it out at the end? Pull it way out to the, to the very back of the problem? Or could I just wait until now to put plus c on the end of it? No. Please don't do that, guys. Don't do that. Because this <coughs> c is really multiplied by x. If you change it and put it outside the brackets, then you're like changing your expression, right? Because then your, your c times x becomes a plus c instead, which is not the same as c times x. So uh, don't get fancy with simplifying things. I'm usually pretty nice about, you know, you don't have to simplify your answers. But if you do try to simplify it and you simplify it wrong, well, <laughs> then I'm going to have to take something off. Probably won't take off a lot of points, but I'll have to take off something because it's not right anymore. So just leave it, just leave it like that, basically. Okay. Now, is this a good final answer? No. No, because what's wrong? We need y. Right. We need y. This is expressed in terms of u. So let's just remember that's why it was helpful that we wrote that down originally. U is equal to y to the two thirds. So this is just y to the two thirds here. So I know what y to the two thirds is, and I want to figure out what y is. So what am I going to do to get y? If I know what y to the 2 thirds is, how do I get y? Put it to the 3 over 2. Right, raise both sides to the 3 over 2, because 2 thirds times 3 halves will just be 1. Right, so y is just this whole entire expression to the 3 halves power, right? So it's x times 2x squared ln x minus x squared plus c, all of that to the 3 halves power. And that would be a perfectly good final answer. Make some sense? Okay. So that's a Bernoulli problem. That kind of gives you an idea of um, what that what that sort of thing might might look like. Okay. Everybody okay on that one? We'll come over here now. So that's a good good review of Bernoulli and linear equations all in one problem. Kind of nice. Well, we're making some pretty, pretty good progress now through the review sheet. It was kind of a slow start, but we're, make, we're making some good time. I think we'll probably get done close to on time, hopefully. Um, okay, so let's go. Uh, I want to do some stuff with um, inner products. Because okay, so that's been a while, and I didn't ask a lot about it on the midterm, but I did spend quite a bit of time on it in class. So I think this would be important. So let's go to problem number 11 on the, on the review sheet. Um, so on problem number 11, they give us a vector space, which is c of 0, 1. This is just the set of calculus functions that are defined on the closed interval 0, 1. And I'm going to give you a proposal of an inner product. So I'm going to define. Remember, guys, that when you work in Rn, when you work in the vector space Rn, you can assume you're using the standard dot product to do inner product spaces. So if I don't tell you the inner product in Rn, just assume it's the standard dot product. But in any other vector space that I want to give you an inner product, I have to tell you what I'm using. The problem has to have that as part of the question. So I have to give you this, and here's what I'm going to give you. Integration from 0 to 1. Remember, we've done this kind of example before. Um, and normally, the, the one that is most standard is f of t times g of t dt. If you go back to the class notes, you'll see that was like the first example that I did of an inner product on the space of functions here. But I'm going to change it slightly and put a t in there. So it's t times f of t, g of t, integrating that from, from 0 to 1. Okay, so this is now what I would call an unusual inner product. 
So one of the first questions that might get asked would be, is it an inner product? Um, or in the case of the way I stated it here, I just said verify any two of the four axioms of an inner product. So I might do that. I might give you a choice and say, pick, pick a couple axioms and verify them. So what kind of axioms do you guys, you guys know that we could verify here? That's a subspace thing. Okay, not, 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 uh, doesn't have anything to do with closure under addition. The axioms of an inner product. <coughs> okay, the inner product of the vector with itself. We have a formula for that, right? Um, or, or we have a requirement on that. So this is actually axiom one, or A, I think you used A, B, C, and D on these. So the inner product of F with itself, uh, what's the requirement that this has to be? Zero. Greater than or equal to zero is the answer. Okay, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So let's check that out. All right, um, so if I plug in to this formula everywhere I see g of t, I'm just going to put f of t instead, I will have t times f of t squared dt. Okay? Now, um, can anybody convince me why that's going to be greater than or equal to zero? Exactly. If I, if I graph the, the t-axis here from zero to one, this function, so f of t, I don't know what f of t is doing, but it is being squared, which means it's at least zero, and it's being multiplied by t, and between zero and one, t is also positive. Right? So whatever this graph is doing, it's creating positive area. Well, we think of integration as being area under the curve, right? And we are integrating a function here that is definitely greater than or equal to zero. Now, if, if the limits of this integral, I did this in a, in a previous review session, if the limits of this integral were minus one to zero, then you'd have a reason right now to stop and say, wait a minute, this is not an inner product. Because if the limits were minus 1 to 0, then your t value would have been negative multiplied by a perfect square, which is positive. Positive times negative is negative. And you'd have a less than 0 answer here, which violates the requirement that it be greater than or equal to 0. So uh, the, the, actually, the limits of integration can kind of be a little bit of a trick that I chose them here to be very nice. Zero to one, and just a T there. Everybody all right with that? Okay, super. So we got that. Um, so that's the first axiom. What other axioms do you know? Anybody remember these things? Exactly. Uh, the inner product of f with g has to equal the inner product of g with f. So that's axiom b, actually. Renee's giving them to me in the right order. Okay, so uh, the inner product of f with g, of course, we have the formula, right? It's just the integral from 0 to 1 of f of t times g of t and then times t. All right, and then the question is, can I switch the positions of the f and the g? Yeah. I certainly can, right? So I can rewrite this as an integral of t times g of t times f of t. I'm allowed to multiply my functions in the opposite order. Okay, and then that is just the inner product of g with f. So there you go. Those two uh, functions can be interchangeable. Make sense? Okay. Um, just, okay, so the question actually asks you only to verify two of the four axioms. But just for thoroughness here, can you guys remind me what the, what the other two axioms actually are? Axiom C, remember what that one said? Right, the, the third axiom has to do with if I have a constant times f, inner product that with g, right, can I pull the constant out? Well, if you look at, in this case, it's pretty easy because if you put C f of t times g of t dt, right, we know that when we do integrations, constants respect integrals, so I can factor the C way out in front. And so that's exactly what you would want to do. 
So c times the integral of t times f of t, g of t, dt. And now that just becomes c times the um, inner product of f of g. So that's the third axiom, or axiom c. Okay. Remember that you can pull constants out of the second slot as well, because if you have a constant in the second slot of an inner product, you can always use axiom B to switch the second slot to the first slot, mm -hmm. then pull it out, and then switch it back again. Right? Uh, and also remember, if there was, so if there was a constant here as well, like CF inner product with CG, when you pull the constant out, you're actually pulling out two factors of C. Right? It kind of looks weird. It looks like you want to just pull out one C, but you actually are pulling out two Cs, one for each slot. Okay? Everybody okay with this axiom? And then the last axiom, which I think I might skip verifying because it takes a little bit of time, but the last axiom, uh, well, does anybody remember what that is? You know, do it that often because usually you're working on the other axioms. The last axiom is the one that says if you add two functions and inner product that with something like g, you can just do a distributive property, right? You can just distribute this. So the inner product of f1 with g plus the inner product of f2 with g. Okay, so that's what you, that's what you'd have. Make sense? Just what was? Uh, I remember when we were going over this. You said there's one that if there, if anyone's gonna fail, it's usually this one, and I don't know. It's, it's axiom A. Did you also mention that if axiom A holds, then there's a very big likelihood that the rest of them should hold as well? Right, if you check axiom A and it works, usually the rest of the axioms also work. Um, so, I mean, I would actually have to stop and think about an example where, where axiom A does work and the others fail. It's usually axiom A that is where the hang-up is with, with these with these properties. We probably could come up with an example, but I don't think I'll, I'll stop to do it right now. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. So all of these axioms, I won't even bother to check this one here. This just says integration respects addition, which it does. Right? We kind of know that. So I'll just leave that off. I just want to go on to part B, and um, I think I'll just put it right here, because that way I can keep it right next to the problem we just, we just worked on. Are there any questions on this, though? One of the reasons I'm going over this one is this is something we haven't used a lot since we did it, and we covered this back uh, like in March around spring break time. So it's been a while. I just wanted to remind you. I do want you to kind of know this a little bit on inner product spaces. So there is a, a, a second part to this. So here's what the question says. Let theta equal the angle between f of x, which is going to equal 12x squared, and g of x, which is going to equal 2x. <coughs> so this is weird. We have functions, and we're talking about an angle between two functions, right? But then what I would like us to find right now is find cosine of theta. OK, let's see if we can find cosine of theta. I guess I am going to need just a little bit more room work my way to the left here a little bit. We have one professor in the department who always lectures from right to left. Um, just likes to do it that way, which is fine. Uh, <laughs> so I'm following his model right now. Um, don't know where he ever picked up the idea, but you know, whatever, whatever works. Uh, OK, so does anybody have a suggestion how we're going to do this? Yeah, we're going to have to use the integration. We're, going to, we're definitely going to have to use this inner product formula in a minute. Um, but sort of in terms of like, I want to get the, picture, the big picture of what's going on here first before I get my hands too involved in the details. Anybody know? I mean, if we see cosine of theta, have we ever seen a formula all semester long that ever had cosine of theta in it? Where theta is the angle between the, the two factors? Yeah. 
or even if you didn't see it this semester, did you see it in 250A? Mm -hmm. Like, there is a formula for this. It has to do with angle. Of course, orthogonal means 90 degrees. But we're not saying that here. We don't even know what theta actually is. Go ahead. When you say f of f times g of x, I think you mean that. Yeah. Okay. Right. We got it. This is the formula for the cosine of theta. Cosine of theta is the inner product of the two vectors divided by the product of their norms. Okay, this is, I mean, you guys would have seen this back in, even in 250A, and we did talk about it earlier this semester. Usually it's written this way. Right? Usually you write it this way. This is just a dot product, a geometric expression for the dot product of two vectors. So, of course, we have to change dot product to inner product in this course. And then to find cosine of theta, I'm going to have to divide by these norms. So you're going to end up with this formula here. Okay. So now we're ready for Pam's suggestion because we now need to do these, the inner product that we have here. So let's just work it out. The inner product of f with g... Well, this is the integral from 0 to 1 of t times f of t. So please don't get your t's and x's mixed. So if it's f of t, that would just be 12t squared, right? So 12t squared. And then times g of t, which would be 2t dt. So this is my numerator of my cosine of theta formula, right? And this becomes the integral from 0 to 1 of, well, 12 times 2 is 24. And then I have t to the fourth, fourth power, exactly. OK, so this is not a hard um, function to integrate by any means. You just have to use the power rule backwards, which is going to give me 24 over 5 times t to the fifth, which we evaluate from 0 to 1. And evaluating from 0 to 1 is also really easy. right? just gives me 24 over 5. Okay. So that's that. Um, what else do I need to calculate here? The norms of the two vectors, right? So I'm going to have to work that out. So let's talk about the norm of f. I'll do the norm of f. Uh, does everybody remember the formula for the norm? Square root of the inner product of what? Of f with itself, exactly. So. The formula here is the square root of the inner product of f with itself. Okay, that would be the square root of, well, now we just do the integral from 0 to 1. Underneath this radical, we're doing this integral from 0 to 1 of <coughs> t times f of t quantity squared. So 12t squared squared dt, right? So we're going to have this integration going on underneath the uh, radical. So this is the square root of the integral from 0 to 1 of, well, let's see, 12 squared is 144, exactly. And then we have t squared squared, which would be t to the fourth. But there's also a t here in, out in front, so it's actually t to the fifth, right? OK, so it gets a little bit messy, but not that bad. All right. So this is the square root of, now I just use my power rule again, 144 t to the 6th over 6, right? So I'm just going to end up dividing that by 6. When I evaluate the uh, t to the 6th from 0 to 1, I'm just going to get 1 again. So I just need to keep track of this number right here. Okay, everybody all right with that? I think that comes out to the square root of 24. 144 over 6, am I right about that? So, yeah, square root of 24. Okay. Everybody good with the, that's just the norm of f. You don't need to simplify that necessarily. I'm just going to leave it like that. Okay, so that's the norm of f. And then finally, back over here real quick, I need the norm of g as well. Okay, the norm of g. So uh, this is just going to be, I'll do this one quickly. Am I, am I going too fast for anybody here? Everybody good with me? Okay, great. So this is the square root of uh, the integral from 0 to 1 of t times whatever g was, 2t quantity squared. All 
All right? So that's the square root of the integral from 0 to 1. Um, I have 2 squared is 4, and then I have t <coughs> cubed, because I have t squared times t. So I'm just integrating 4t cubed, right? Well, that's easy. That's just uh, t to the fourth from 0 to 1 just gives me 1. It just gives me 1 as an answer. Okay, that's pretty easy. Okay, good. So, uh, therefore, we can figure out the cosine of theta if I come back over here again. Um, the cosine of theta would just be 24 fifths was what we got for the inner product of f of g. And then the norm of f was the square root of 24, and the norm of g was just a 1. And that would be fine. I mean, you can simplify that. It's just the square root of 24 divided by 5. OK? Nick, can you pan over here for just a second, just so I can show everybody the final, final answer? Thank you, sir. So 24 fifths, and then divided by the norm of f and the norm of g. Just gives me the square root of 24 divided by 5. Good enough? Are these uh, two functions orthogonal? What's orthogonal mean? The inner product needs to be 0. Was it 0? No, not at all. Right. So they're not orthogonal. Let's say we wanted to make an orthogonal basis for the span of f and g. How would I do it? I'd have to use the Gram-Schmidt procedure. Right? And the Gram-Schmidt procedure, I'm not going to, I won't even do it right now. I mean, basically, I'm going to give you those formulas. Those formulas just involve norms and inner products, just the same way that we just did here. You just have to follow the roadmap of those formulas. You have to write down what are the, which functions go in which places, basically. Okay, that's kind of what you have to do. So, um, so great, that's just a, a quick little uh, example, though, using the cosine of theta and using an inner product that is not a standard one. So I could give you something like this. Another way I could ask the question would be, is this an inner product? Then you have to go through and check the steps, right? And if axiom A works, more than likely it is an inner product. And if it doesn't work, well, then you have a counterexample for me. Okay. All right. Very good. I'm happy with that, I think. Um, let's do a, a couple of maybe theoretical problems. How's that sound? <laughs> People can always use a little practice with the theory. Cranking them, up, cranking them out now. Or we've done... Five of these problems, anyway? We've done half of the problems on the review sheet. It's only taken two and a half hours. So another two and a half hours will be done. <laughs> Just teasing. I've done this, the hardest ones, the longest ones, and we also took a long time getting into the problems. So we're actually speeding up pretty well right now. So let's do um, problem number eight now. This is like a series of theoretical problems. Now, on the final, I may not just the thing is, I'm dropping your two lowest problems. So um, in the past, I would write my finals, and guess what would happen? I would write, two, I would write the theoretical problems as two separate problems. Guess what would happen? Everybody would just skip those two, right? <laughs> Completely skip those two, and I'm like, that's not what I want. I don't want people to, to just think it's not important and that they get to skip. So I tend to blend them together a little bit. Um, so even though I've got them all in one problem here, they may show up in parts on, on uh, some other problems. So some of these we've kind of looked at before, but I just want to go over them again. So here's the first one, part A. Give an example. So you have to create an example of two diagonalizable matrices, A and B, <coughs> such that a plus B is not diagonalizable. So A is diagonalizable, B is diagonalizable, but A plus B is not. That's what we want to get in. 